Hi there, my name's Mike Mulvihill. During 2017, I recorded two documentaries. One about the narrow gauge railway system which operated from Belturbet in County Cavan to Drummond in County Leitrim and also took in Kiltubrit, Drumshambo and Arigna. It was broadcast at Easter time 2017. And the second documentary, which was broadcast in December of 2017, was on the big snow of 1947. On both of those documentaries, I spoke to a man who will also feature on this documentary, Noel McPartland from Drumshambo in County Leitrim. It was during the two conversations with Noel about the narrow gauge and the big snow of 1947 that the following pieces were recorded. Leard's factory in Drumshambo, County Leitrim was a major employer to the local area and the products it made featured on breakfast tables around Europe, around Ireland, around Canada, the United States and the Middle East. At one point, Leards was producing over 30 tonnes of jam and marmalade per each eight-hour shift. I met Noel McPartland for a chat in his museum Glimpses of the Past in Drumshambo Town. It's located over the Credit Union offices. He first explained how Leards started. Leards, you know, first came here around the 1830s. Their first venture was a leather shop down now where the mill race pub is so there's no cars or anything and they, they ran a business there for years and then Caleb came along he was born in 1880 and he was the great entrepreneur the tin house there as I used to call it we always called it the tin house it was occupied by two sisters from uh, over around our Carn, they were the Miss Derbys and they used to make jam in their own house for a very small market but Caleb Laird was thinking of going into the jam business, so he decided he'd buy them out and brought them to Drumshambo, and they became his producers for the jam in the factory. And they were with them until the boat died. One of them got married to a man called Hall, uh, but she passed away there about 10 years ago. But they, worked, they were in Laird's factory when I was there. The bits their first jam factory in 1935, but at that time there were also maize millers flower factors, wholesale merchants, agents for Austin cars and lorries. Now that excerpt from the Cavan Celt was uh, 1935. So even before he started the jam, they were involved in so many other things, including the electric light station. There were also uh, agents for Austin cars and lorries and members of the IMTA, Irish Motor something or other, and a fishing garage and repair service. But they were, they were amazing, actually. But he started that business in 1935, and he, his first brand was Breffney Blossom. And he ran a competition to get a name for the jam. And a lady from Drumkirlin, the Miss McTiernan, came up with that name, and she won the great prize of five pounds, which was a lot of money in 1935. It, it turned out to be a good name, and he had that brand up until the mid-50s, until Raymond, his son, took over the business and introduced Bo Peep Jam. And how many people were employed? Well, at the fullest time that had been over 100 full-time employees and there'd be another 50 part-timers that were taken on during the summer to pack peel and cherries for the Christmas trade. They came in around July, August and they worked there till Christmas. But there was always jobs going there, you know? And when you think about it then, the knock-on effect for other employment, we'll say with the glass jars, with that's the lids, right, with right. the labelling... We did all, the, all of that, you know, we bought our glass jars from Irish Glass Bottle. We had a company in Longford did all our labelling, Turners of Longford. They were great to leave their business local, where possible. Now, it wasn't always possible, but they looked after the local scene, really. And and, and then the, the produce, the, the ingredients that they would use for the jam, the berries and well, things like that. Fruit, were, the fruit now was bought was... They the formed uh, the Calvin Monaghan fruit growers. They were contracted to Laird's to grow fruit. We also f had one in uh, Longford, North Longford and Leitrim. And we got all our strawberries, of course, from Wexford. Of course, we had to take our oranges from Spain. People don't realise we were so busy down there that time. 
there was a, always a, a huge waiting list for people looking for jobs. And in a sense, you know, if you had a relation working there, you had a very good chance of getting back in. I remember the Lairs were very devout Methodists, but they actually, as a point I often make, 98% of their employees were Catholic. But Lairds closed on every church holiday in the year in deference to their staff, you know. And Caleb himself, he was one of the few men with a car back in, in, in the 30s and 40s, he often drove people into Mass on a Sunday. But there were that type of people, and then they looked after their own church on the Carrick Road, the Methodist Church there. I remember they bought the, I don't remember this, obviously, but in 1912, they bought um, the organ from the Methodist Church in Donegal Square in Belfast. And Caleb Laird, I think he paid 12,000 for that, and he had to pay that to raise the roof of the Methodist Church to accommodate the organ, and he paid for all the, 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 the work to be done there, you know. But there were devout Methodists and, and, you know, lovely people to deal with and extremely honest. I joined the company in 64, and I was there until almost 92, and uh, then I started my own business. By the time when we started the Food Hub, which is almost 14 years ago, on the 10th of March, we, uh, that's how the Food Hub became a reality, when we started, we got our grants and all the rest. But I brought back Bo Peep Jam in the market for sentimental reasons. Not a great reason for building a business, but I have it on the market. I supply a few very good shops and uh, they're very loyal to me and I'm hoping that somebody else will take it over from me when I'm gone, you know. Yeah, and it's it's something at home we'd often have in the morning on toast or on bread, bo peep jam, and Marmalade. it's something that we'd notice on the on the shelves locally as well. Yeah, it's it's more local and a little bit of regional now, but I can never see myself going national with it, you know. But we have it. There's actually Raymond Laird sitting there in in, in his warehouse for this consignment of jam going to Saudi Arabia. I did all that market for them for nearly 20 years out in Saudi and uh, Dubai when the place was only a, a shambles coming, coming out of the desert, you know. So when when we're talking about jam and about about Leard's factory, um, the narrow gauge rail system would have been very important for oh, very much so. getting goods in and out of the town and uh, stock Caleb Laird was a great supporter of the railway and in fact I'll show you a picture later on of him sitting in the last train engine heading out of town in 1959 but he was a great supporter of it because there were agents for Ranks Flower and all of the consignment came by rail. It might come to Drummond and on then to Balnamore and down here. And then all of the supplies for the shops in the town. My mother had a small shop down in Church Street where we were all reared. Most of our supplies came on the narrow gauge from different, like Jacob's Biscuits and all of the rest, which unfortunately are no longer made in Ireland, they're made in the UK. The Lairds were, were a vital part of this town for so long, and regressively, Raymond passed away about 14 years ago, actually. Uh, Caleb died at the age of 92. That picture there, you see, was the opening of Lairds factory, which is now the food hub, in 1983. And you may recognise that man there, that's John Bruton, Minister for Industry and Commerce. That's the late Patrick Rose from Balnamore. Uh, that's Pori Quiet of the IDA, and that's Raymond and Betty Laird. We had a very big range of products that time. Yeah, it was, it was a huge range. We're looking at a table for the benefit of people listening, and the table is probably seven foot, it is, maybe, actually, maybe yeah. seven foot, and it's covered, covered with products yeah, made. What you see there now is retail jars. You see uh, little, these little tubs at the back were, were uh, ja jam for the bakeries and the catering trade. There was, um, I think, seven pound tins. And then you had, we did orange squash. We did gift packs for, for the American market. Uh, you had, we did peel and cherries for the Christmas trade. And that resulted in about 30 or 40 people getting 
uh, part-time employment in the summer to start packing this for the, for the Christmas trade. And th those jobs were picked up like that every year, get a job in Lairns for the summer, young, young people home from school and all that, you know. But they were a vital part of the area and uh, they left a great legacy. And there's one other interesting thing here. Yeah, we had Matt Busby came to Drumshambo in 1971. Matt was on his way to uh, Ballina. They did a lot of work with uh, merchandising stuff with a company called Mako, who used to make flags and all kinds of stuff. And they had a contract with Man United. So he took a helicopter from Dublin and he had to refuel. So he refueled, you know where the food hub is now? Yeah. Just up there, he landed there, and Raymond Laird met him. There was Pat McGrath, who was a director of Man United, and there was Pat Crerand, who was a famous footballer. See them here. Uh, and you can see the helicopter. Yeah, the, the, and the refuel there, and then they went on to Balanna. But there were all the kids, now I wasn't there that day, but I know that all the kids in the town were up. What, looking at this, that was 1970, 1970-71. One thing to note about all the photographs on display here, we're not talking about photographs as such, we're talking about photographs which have been blown up to poster size. That's right, yeah, I got that done in 2009. We were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the closing of the railway. All those pictures were blown up done for me by Sign Warehouse, Cormac Rogers. He did those in 2009. And they really are very very effective. And people come in and say, gee, that's a fantastic picture. Now, if it was much smaller, you wouldn't just see the detail of it, but it's, it's marvelous. This was what I referred to earlier. Caleb Laird was given the honor of supposedly driving the train from Drumshambo as it left for the last time out as far as Kiltubber. At that stage, Caleb was uh, 80 years of age. And that's the man himself, Caleb Laird, who worked until he was about 88, and he died at the age of 92. Noel McPartland now describes the early days of electricity in Drumshambo. Just on the electrification side, we had the electricity here from 1905 until 1955 due to the good offices of, of Caleb Laird who was the founder of C.S. Laird Limited and he supplied electricity to the town from 1905 until rural electrification came in in 1955 and we were well ahead of a lot of other towns but there was actually a lot of towns from say Ballyconnell Beltorbid Ballyconnell down into Drumshambo onto Boyle, Sligo with the same type of systems. It was the old uh, DC system, I think, and it was pretty reliable. I was reared in Drumshambo as a born and reared here, and I can remember the electric light so well because I only lived four doors up the street from it. You'd hear this hum from the time the light would come on during the evening, in the winter time, and it would go off about midnight, and then you could go back to sleep. <laughs> and Just an amazing memory from that, you know? The electricity would have been created from, it would have been a wheel and water, was it that right? Was, it was the mill race system. And in fact, in front of where it used to be, there's a replica wheel down there now, opposite Laird House. That was Laird's Mill. And to the left of that was the um, generating station. And it was powered by the mill race system. It gave very good light to the town for, for all those years. Initially, he started it out to power his own enterprises. He had the mill and he had several other things, but he came up with this idea of supplying the town and he got a, a man from Wicklow, Jack Kane. And Jack came up here about 1903 and he was the man that set up the whole thing. There's a picture here of Jack. I had two of his grandsons in here last year and they gave me this picture. That's Jack Kane there now when he was retired. He lived out almost up at the National School on the, on the Balnamore Road. But he died here about 1963, I think. And this here would be the original That's, water... It's not a great picture, but it's the original water wheel, but it's the only one I could get. And that was his, one of his sons. That was Charlie Kane, who became a chief superintendent in Mullingar. 
Uh, he passed away a few years ago as well, but Jack and his son Charlie, and he had three or four kids. And in fact, one of his daughters married my uncle, Michael Doherty, so <laughs> there's a connection there. It's amazing at my stage in life, I can walk around the town, I can remember all the occupants of the various houses, going back maybe three or four generations. And it's hard to believe now, but the town has changed so much. Yeah. And thankfully, the town is moving quite well. We're lucky here at the moment now. We have what Laird's built in 83 in the new factory, which is now the food hub. And that's an enormous success, thank God. But a lot of that, we, go, we can trace all that back to Laird's um, entrepreneurship, you know. He was just an unbelievable, and Raymond carried that on. We've a lot to be thankful for there, you know. And now his son Gary has retired and he's living in Ballina. And his daughter Sandra has retired in London and she's back living in Sligo. And Roger lives in, in Oscarry and Shirley is in Northern Ireland. But a great company to work for and poor old Betty passed away there last year, Raymond's widow. You know, there was no such thing as you know, I can't do that job, that's not my job. Everybody pitch in. And when we were flying there in the 70s and early 80s, we were doing nearly six million in exports to the Middle East and to um, North America, but particularly the Middle East. Oh, there's St. John's Church of Ireland from Shambo. These were records that were given to me by Frances McManus, Cora Hill. She knew somebody who was doing this and she got a copy for me and she presented it to us. It covers baptisms from 1886 to 2004, burials from 1885 to 2002, marriages 1845 to 1866, more marriages from 1910 to 1952. And this particular book, uh, people come in here of Church of Ireland or Methodist because the graveyard down at on Church Street is a Church of Ireland graveyard but it also serves as a burial place for the Methodists. But when you go through that book, Mike, uh, you see the early years of it now going back to 1886 on that particular one and further back. But when we get towards the end, the whole population of Church of Ireland has dropped off. The last man buried there that's noted in this book was Raymond Laird in 2004. You see, going back to that, those times, and you had the war, and you had the economic war in England, and a lot of the, after the, the treaty, a lot of Protestant companies moved back to the north. But Raymond, or Caleb Laird didn't, and he's actually flying the flag here on this particular ad where he says, trade inquiries cordially invited from all parts of Unser's thought. Like a man say, I didn't leave, you know? Yeah. It's quite amazing. Uh, this particular thing here was something from Leachman County Council, an extract from the minutes of, of the annual meeting held on Thursday, the 17th of June, 1920. The resolution proposed by James Rinn, seconded by James Connolly, resolved that this council of the elected representatives of Leitrim at a duly convened meeting hereby acknowledge the authority of Dáil Éireann as the duly elected government of the Irish people and undertakes to give effect to all decrees duly promulgated. I won't go on any further, but it's an interesting thing. It whether, is, yeah. Whether that resolution had any effect on national government, I don't know. These are old pictures of uh, the girls' primary school here, and I have three aunts in that picture taken in 1920. That's a photograph there, again, going back to Joe Mooney. You can't talk to Bertram Shambo unless he, he holds me in the picture. He was made Man of the Year in 1971. And he had Jack Lynch down and Maureen Lynch. And that's Ray McSherry. And that's, that's uh, Dr. Gibbons and his wife. That's Joe and Eva. And that was the man behind the Leitrim Guardian, which was Michael Fox from Anna Hamilton. And this lady here was Pat Quinn of Pat Quinn Supermarkets, if you ever heard of him, from Clune originally. That's Pat's wife. Pat couldn't make it. He was probably down in one of the stores around the country. But that was taken at a function 
when Joe was made Man of the Year in 19, uh, Leitrim Man of the Year in 1971. Van Thorsten started as an, a national festival in 1953. That was the original poster that, that was all around the country. And I got that from Pascal Mooney and a lot of other stuff as well. But that, that was the original poster, Easter Sunday, April the 5th, uh, to April the 26th, 1953, that was the period that they ran the Toastal. And of course, that's a great portrait of Joe Mooney himself. And that's his late brother, Father Canis, who was a Franciscan scholar and a great historian, great Celtic scholar, and he died at the age of 52. He fought with Leitrim County Council for quite some time to open up a swimming pool. And eventually, I think he had them annoyed so much they gave in. And the swimming pool was built about 1971. I know all my kids now learn to swim there. And he was the man that just, uh, as well as getting them to build it, he also got them to maintain it, which was very important. And from that then you had the playground came, and then you had the tennis courts, all because of that man. And today then, you have the new boardwalk. And that, all, that whole complex, including the boardwalk, is due to that man's entrepreneurship in the 1970s, late 60s and early 70s. And I'm now hoping to get a plaque put up there, because there's no plaque to him out of that swimming pool. This is Joe Mooney. Joe Mooney, and there should be, because he deserves it. And Noel, there was a lot of different connections with supermarkets and people from Leitrim running or owning them over the years. Well, that's very true, uh, Michael. In fact, um, Leitrim played a big part in the development of supermarkets and self-service um, grocery shops generally. Now, the first one of those would be Musgrave Brothers from Cork, who came from within two and a half miles from here in a townland called Dernasu on the Leitrim Roscommon border and the worship here in the church in Drumshamba. They'd be related to the Lairds through marriage. But back in 1870, two of those brothers left Dernasu and went to um, Cork, eventually finished up in Cork. I think they went to Limerick first and they founded Musgrave Brothers. And initially they were involved in the tea importing business. And in fact, in later years, they were responsible for importing a, a brand called PG Tips. And uh, they, they also then, in their wholesale grocery place, they started the franchise for VG, which was then eventually became Super Value Centra. But they started, you could almost say, the first supermarkets in, in Ireland, apart from then Dunn. And that was the Musgraves. But then you had... Uh, Another man from Mohol, uh, George Tuttle, who went to Galway in the late 50s, early 60s. And he opened up a supermarket in Shop Street in Galway. It was a supermarket stroke self-service. There, was, there wasn't much difference between the two, really. But he opened up this uh, supermarket and he called it GTM Stores. And the GTM stood for George Tuttle Mohol. And... Uh, he did a huge business there, and he built a fantastic house out in Barna. Because I remember his wife, his late wife, who I think she was a tailor from Boyle, she took me out to the house one time to show me this beautiful house, which cost at that time, in the mid-60s, about 25 grand. That was a lot of money at that time. With a lot of money. And they had a swimming pool. But George, anyway, had the first supermarket in Galway, and his son then went on and opened a supermarket, or probably one of the second or third one in, in Nace, in Kildare. But then you had Raymond Laird, from Drumshambo, who uh, opened the first supermarket in Drogheda, on West Street in Drogheda, in about 1960-61. And he ran that supermarket, or had a, had a manager there from Drumshambo, Charlie Egan, who originally came from Valley Moat. And Charlie ran that for about 10 years and eventually bought the supermarket off Raymond and ran it for many more years afterwards. Now, it's no longer there. It's now, I think, uh, a bank on, on, on West Street in Drogheda. Uh, so that's, that was um, Raymond Laird. And then you had, of course, that great entrepreneur from Clune, Pat Quinn, 
who was a, a couple of years ahead of me in St. Mel's in Longford. And I went to school with his brother, Fursey. And Pat opened uh, a supermarket in Stillorgan and Quinsworth, known as Quinsworth, and had several branches before he finally sold out to uh, Tesco in the later years. Um, and the final one that I can talk about on that is, is a man from another man from Mohol, Cecil Clark, who was uh, part of the Bradshaw and Clark Company in in Mohol. They had a grocery stroke um, hardware shop, but Cecil branched out on his own and went to Navan and opened the first supermarket there back in um, again in the late sixties, early seventies. So for a small county, it was amazing the contribution they made to the development of the self-service and supermarket trade generally. There's a picture of oh, yeah, that, Caleb Laird. Is it well, Caleb Laird actually had the first car in Leitrim, IT1. That's it there. And it's still, it's still it's in a museum in Yorkshire. And when, when they changed the number, numbers here back in the 70s to AIT, Raymond got, bought the first plate. Somebody else had got it, but he bought it from him, just to have a kind of a historical connection. The father's car was IT1, and that's AIT1. And uh, a stylish car too, a yeah. Jaguar. Oh yeah, a Jaguar, that's right. Now this was the car, that IT1, that was taken outside the, the Spa Hotel in Lucan, which you're probably familiar with. Yeah. And there's Caleb Laird, and I don't know who the other people are, but it was quite a, you can see all the staff out looking at the car. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, the, the car reminds me maybe of the, the model that we would have seen in the movies around Michael Collins and yeah. different films like that. There's always a debate about that registration because in the middle of all that there were motorbikes and different stuff registered. But to the best of our knowledge anyway, AIT, IT1 was the first car registered in Leitrim, obviously. Over here now we have a little bit more stuff about Laird's. That Laird's also on two creameries. And if you notice there, this is a, 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 an accounts book for, for the creameries in Balnamore and Drumshambo. And the writing in it is just fantastic, really. Now, for instance, there's a... It's even a better one than that now, for instance. That's fantastic writing. And of course, one of the prerequisites to get a job in any of these places in those days, not just their own nerds, you had to be a very good writer. And I think that's a great writing, and that's 1916. Now, this book here covers the wages book in Laird's from 1936 to 1943. Well, I think it started actually in 37. And that wages book was kept by Caleb Laird himself. He wasn't the best of writers, but I can read through there. But when I first got this book, I saw a man called Druitt was paid five pounds a week in 1937. And there was no deductions. But it turned out he was a, a professional jam maker from Scotland, from Keelers in Dundee. He was brought over and he stayed with the company for about five years to get it up and running. The next highest paid there was Jack Kane, the man that was doing the electricity. There's another man down here, Kelly, but he was a contractor. But this book, the amazing part of it, goes all the way to 1943 and very little change in wages. So there was no inflation and there was no demand, there was no unions demanding, looking for raises. They actually basically are the same wages when you get to, when you get to uh, 1943. Jack Yen is still on two pounds ten shillings a week. Yeah. Mr. Druid has gone back to Scotland, and the wages vary from two ten down to sixteen and four pence a week. But those are over thirty five people employed there. So what other? There's so many photographs here. Now, what what other ones? These are pictures of the old town. Now there is that's a picture again of a fair day in Drumshambo, sometime in the late forties, and. Everything was done on the street. There was a fair green down there, but people would, go, would use the fair green, but other people wouldn't go near it because they had to pay a toll. So they did all their selling on the street, off their carts and all the rest. 
And the market yard, of course, was a haven for them as well. But look at that for a crowd that's in town that day. And what year did you say this again? That, that's roughly about, I'd say, that's about 1947, 48. On a Sunday. Because the people are all very well dressed. They're in for mass. And uh, that's a, a pony and trap. The only vehicle on that street now is that, an old truck. T.J. McManus's, Joseph McManus's shop in those days. But the men came in after mass... They went into the pub, that's Cunningham's on the high street, and they drank. And the poor women sat in the whatever vehicles they had outside waiting for these men to come out to bring them home for their dinner. And just looking on the, the photographs here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six high Nelly bicycles, that's I right. suppose, would that's be right. the that's right, right way to describe them. And this guy coming down on one here. Now, that building there, which is now... Leah's hairdressing, you might see it there. And you have the barracks here. But that was the courthouse in Drumshambo up to the late 50s. That's Cain's tiles there now. Prior to that, it was Jim Cain's butcher shop. But that was the courthouse. And that's where the courts were held all those years ago, you know. Now, that's Church Street in the 50s. Another fair day. More carts. Places black with people. That was Campbell's shop, which is now Gala. That's where their restaurant is. Big changes, really. Uh, the convent opened in 1864, and when they came here first, while the convent was being built, the, the owner of this house, um, McCones, the nuns operated from there for a short period, and then they moved to the new premises up there. Now, in my time as a mass server in that convent in the 40s, you had at least 45 nuns there. Today, there are only four, and they're getting a few more in from the Philippines, but huge change. And the convent that we're talking about is the Poor Clear Sisters. Poor Clear Guns, yeah, the Poor Clear Sisters. And they've been a huge asset of this area all those years. And then you have a shot here from Dresterna now, looking back down on the town. And again, that shot is the same as the one... See this here? Yeah. It's down here, you see. The same truck is parked there. So those two pictures were taken the same day. That was the original Roxy Cinema, which was opened by Michael John Giblin from out at uh, Cordray in 1953. And I can remember so many of the, of the films we had, like from A Bell for a Dano, which was about the Second World War, I think, and it was, it was made in Italy. It was about uh, the war in Italy at the time. Uh, and the, John Wayne, all those cowboy guys, you know, Tom Mix and all that. I can remember all them vividly. And full crowds, I'm sure, every weekend. Oh, yes, they got they packed it out. There was another cinema in Carrick run by John J. Flood. And he, they were they were before Drumshambo now, but Michael John came in and opened up this. And then, another seven years later, he opened up the Mayflower Ballroom. And uh, that's now a very thriving community centre, which is marvellous. Now, the oldest of those pictures would be this one here. That was the main street. That's now Central Supermarket there, Betty Gibbons's. These two poor children, I don't know who they are. Nobody could ever tell me who they are. That's the old High Street. And you had the market yard here now, which is a parking area. And that was McKeown's um, house. A lady called Lucy McKeown lived there. Now, they'd be related to, the, to Farrell McKeown and... Um, John McKeown. And this would be now the library? That's now the library. That was bought eventually by B.J. Early, who owned this building we're in now. And he bought that building, because there was a fire in that in 1964. And he, kept, he bought that building just to keep the business going. And then he moved back to the new building. And if, if, if I'm remembering right, was, was there an early shop maybe around here beside the Sintra? The name over the door there is Laird. Caleb Laird was born in that house. And his father, Glover Laird, and his wife lived there as well. Next door you had another relation of Laird was Crawford's. They owned that. And later on, uh, Ben Early bought it and he moved into it. 
But here then you had the Bank of Ireland. But at that stage, it wasn't the Bank of Ireland. That was Lynn's hardware. And there was a Lynn in Ballyfarnham as well, so they were related. That, that was all built by, by Caleb Laird. Yeah, I have memories when I was younger coming to Drumshambo shopping and a uh, television shop. That, I think. that would have been early, yeah. Early TV. And at one stage, that was known as Wesleyan Street. Wesleyan Street? Yeah, after the founder of Methodism. And he also built the houses on the Carrick Road now where, where um, Mrs. Mooney, God rest her, lived, where the Mooneys lived. And. Um, was a great benefactor to the Methodist Church there, you know. Uh, that's a better picture of it there now. Again, it's it's layered, and that's Caleb himself, nineteen o three. What age do you think he'd be there now? You would probably say from where he is, maybe maybe sixty. <laughs> 23. No, it's, it's, it's probably just the, it's, it's probably the hat yeah, and the at, suit. At and that stage, it was, you looked older, you know. But he was, he was the man that really kept this town going during the, that and the Arigna Mines. Kept from Shamba going during the, the emergency and during the different recessions we had. We were always quite lucky, actually, in that regard. How did the closure come about? Well, the closure came about we in the 70s, um, I mean, which was a difficult time uh, because you had, inflation was high and all that. But we were lucky that we were in markets you know, like the Middle East and we were getting huge uh, volume business because I was sent out there for the first time in 1977, I think it was. Now, we had been doing business with a small distributor in, in, in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia. And I was advised by Chorus Throchtal at the time that somebody should go out and meet them because there could be more business there. And to my amazement, when I finally got there, I discovered that there was... I, I came home that time with 64 containers of jam spread over 12 months. Back payment back by a letter of credit. And that actually had that factory working nearly overtime. And we, and that was the reason we probably built the new factory because we weren't able to cope down here, you know, and it was fairly anti, antiquated anyway. But the new factory was built and then we hit the bad 80s and the high interest rates and all the rest. And we had certain difficulties then with bridging finance when building the new factory. And the banks, and this is where I'm going to <laughs> lacerate a few of them, <laughs> the banks who were begging us for business. I remember a man coming from the Northern Bank, from Belfast, to meet Raymond Laird. And Raymond brought me up to the house to explain our business in the Middle East. And he was begging for our, our uh, Middle East business. And we gave it to him in, in, in 1984, 83, 84. They didn't want to know us. They just... And you know, the banks had money that time. It wasn't like what happened in, in, in the, rece the recent recession. But they put a lot of pressure on us and eventually it was sold as a going concern to Larry Goodman in 1988. And I was absolutely at the heart of that sale, myself and Sean Nolan. And Larry heard ours was for sale and he sent down the late... Brian Britton, who only passed away a couple of weeks ago, a gentleman, and Liam Lawler, the famous Fianna uh, Fáil TD, who was a kind of a lobbyist for, for Goodman, and uh, eventually they bought it, and they held it for a few years, and then they sold it to Keypack. And then Keypack closed it in 96 or 97, and Sean Nolan and myself and the late Jim McPadden, God rest him, we chased it as he could we buy it. But we had no money. But we were trying to get some kind of a deal off them, but it didn't happen. And it lay there for another three years, and I got a man in to buy the whole lot, the land and the factory. And we got a long lease from him. And 
consequently the Food Hub came. And it gives me great pleasure to go up there today now and see 77 people employed up there and yeah. more to come, you know. And the Food Hub today now is an example of what small communities can do for themselves. We, when I suppose, I was very sentimental with me because I was so attached to the place, having been with Lairds from 1964. And at that stage, I was with them nearly 25 years. We waited, for, it was 2003, when we knew the deal was in place. So we were six or seven years struggling with it. And uh, the reason I remember well, I was waiting for a phone call on the 3rd of March, 2003, from um, TPAC to know whether they're going to go ahead or not. And I was also waiting for a phone call from my eldest son in London, whose first baby was due. And my first grandchild arrived, God bless her, she's 15 today. And uh, on the 3rd of March, that evening that I got a call, the deal was on. And we never looked back, and why well, we didn't, we, we worked hard, because we took on board at that time Orla Casey of Momentum Consulting, you might know her. She had just left the Leitrim Enterprise Board and she joined, she took, took our case on board, and through her and myself, we scoured every agency in the country for, for funding. And there was plenty of funding at that time, as you know. And we, we accessed approximately 1.7 million over, over time to get that place going. And we were greatly helped by, by um, one man in particular, the late, great Dermot Gallagher from Carrick and Shannon, who was on the board of International Fund for Ireland. And he absolutely looked after us on that, made an application on our behalf and we got two tranches of money from them. He was um, an ambassador in, 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 in America for a while, but he was also heading up the Department of Foreign Affairs and he was head of the International Fund for Ireland. And we went in for funding and we got it and we went back again. We had the cheek to go back again about two years later for more. And I rang him one day and I said, I'm in Dublin next Wednesday week, Dermot. I'd like to meet you. Went in, told him anyway. And told him what we were doing. We were going in for another trench. Leave it with me, he said. And uh, within three months, we had another tranche. And then we had another very good man in Donegal. His father died there recently, the late Paddy Hart, young Paddy. He was, he was uh, involved in the International Fund as well. He says, you're looking for too much, but I'll tell you what you will get. And then we had Enterprise Ireland, another Donegal woman. Maeve Connaughton was brilliant to us, and she got our funding in place. Following on from the factory being sold as a going concern, Noel McPartland had an idea of what he could do with the site. And I had this idea about the food hub because I had seen something similar in, in Pennsylvania some years before that, especially uh, the, a kitchen where the people were thinking of going into small food businesses where they could come in and develop their product. But from that, we converted this 32,000 square foot factory into nine units. One of them now is the hospitality kitchen. So it's on the course 10 months every year. We train people, chefs and, and waiters and everything for the hospitality trade. And then we have um, Chef in a Box, which does um, uh, very good ready meals. We have uh, a great company that a local company that was established when they came into us, uh, Magnus Boxty, and full praise to Des and Michael. They came in there and they have done a fabulous job and they were a, f a great benefit to us when they came in. And then we got uh, Marty Deegan and Sinead in with the, with the, um, the brewery and they made a huge difference. And they, from them, they were followed in then by the distillery the shed distillery and uh, and then we have uh, the, sh the cheese hub there Sean Midline 
and I have a little jam business up there and I can assure you that if you start a business out of sentiment there's not much profit in it because you finish up giving half of it away anyway. There was one unit up there we never developed. We have a waiting list of people to come in there but the people that need the space more than anybody are the people we have in there already and they'll be taking most of that space. And the distillery have huge plans for their, their um, visitor centre. Yeah, and we're talking, like, you know, about the gunpowder gin, yeah. very, very popular, and only in the last couple of weeks, uh, a sausage drink. <laughs> yeah, though, you, you can't keep a good man down, you know. Pat Rigney is, the, as I say, the curious mind of Pat Rigney. But Pat came up with the gunpowder gin, and it's been an enormous success. It's quite remarkable now. And he unveiled his whiskey, which was in maturation stage for three years. He did that at Christmas. And he hasn't time to start doing the whiskey yet. He'll probably do it in the second part of this year. But now he's come up with the sausage tree uh, vodka. Now, the sausage tree, and I had heard of a sausage tree because I've been to South Africa three or four times. And the sausage tree seems to be a very medicinal type botanical thing you know but, but Pat has it now and whether you like the name or not you might get used to it but he's la- he launched it last week in at the big uh, drinks fair in Dusseldorf in Germany but it's hard to keep track of that man he's fantastic and he has a huge interest in the area you see and the Drumshamba part of that name is the most important part to him because he's always talking about the rural area that we're in and the jobs that he's creating and all the others, you know. But I couldn't say enough for all of those tenants up there. They're just unbelievable. And here's another famous man from from Shambo in the past, Noel. That's right, Mike. It's it's Larry Welsh, shoemaker extraordinary, from Cranston Avenue and ultimately from the Dora Road. And that picture was taken by some client of his. It's a great picture because he's surrounded by shoes. And that's the way, it, it was total chaos in that shop. Yeah. And you went back for your show, you might get one and you might get the other a week later. But Larry was one of the great characters. And there's a terrific poem here about him. And it says, um, If your boots are thin, just walk right in. And, and look and watch and wonder. For yours are not the only boots that Larry's torn or sundered. His hammer and his nails are sharp in any kind of weather. So don't delay and come his way and keep your soul together. (laughs) We've come to the end of this programme. I do hope you enjoyed our visit to Drumshambo in County Leitrim. My thanks to Noel McPartland for his help, where we talked about Laird's Jam Factory, the Laird's family themselves, the buildings of Drumshambo, the town of Drumshambo, and some of the moments which Noel recalled, like the visit of Matt Busby or Larry's poem, which we finished with. Until next time, for myself, Mike Mulvihill, don't forget you can follow me on twitter.com forward slash Mike's Powerplay for further updates on documentaries.